so we were discussing the role of debora number in characterizing a polymeric material as well as in characterizing any earthly material now debora number de it is calculated from the ratio of relaxation time by experimental time now lambda here refers to the relaxation time and t is the experimental time now the significance of these two times are that the t time is that time through which some stress is being applied on a material and lambda is the relaxation time that is after time t when the stress is withdrawn then how long the material takes to come to its original shape or original dimension now the ratio of these two is a dimensionless parameter regarded as the debora number now this debora number is a very significant parameter that distinguishes the characteristic behavior of a polymeric and a non polymeric material suppose if you take an elastic solid crystalline elastic solid we know that the i mean characteristics of uh, this elastic behavior is that when the stress is withdrawn uh, from uh, an elastic solid then it would recover within no time almost to original shape or original dimension so in that way it has almost a uh, relaxation time very very minimum so that way the debora number for a crystalline solid elastic solid is very close to zero whereas polymer being a macromolecule it takes higher amount of time for recovery that is it has lambda which is greater than t and because of that for polymeric materials which are macromolecular in nature they have the debora number greater than 1 on the other hand if a material is highly viscous highly viscous then in that case for example say liquids viscous liquids highly viscous liquids so in those cases the debora number is going to be much much greater than 1 so here this is an important point to remember that for a polymeric material the debora number is greater than 1 but for a completely viscous liquid the debora number is much much greater than 1 so if we distinguish a polymeric material from a crystalline solid and from a viscous liquid is that the debora number is within 0 to say much much greater than 1 means a very higher value of debora number so it is in between that for a polymeric material and that way we consider a polymeric material is to be a semi solid in nature semi solid in nature and from that view we call it this material as visco elastic with with prominent exhibition of both viscous character and elastic character so this is a very significant uh, observation in case of a polymeric material which are composed of monomers and those monomers are bound through covalent linkage now this polymeric material could be organic and inorganic in nature so we can have organic macromolecules as well as inorganic macromolecules which are polymeric in nature organic and inorganic now organic macromolecules or polymer means the polymers which are composed of carbon carbon backbone utilizing the catenation property of carbon and as we know that organic compounds which are present in living organisms they contains carbon backbone so from that similarity the polymers having carbon carbon backbone are regarded as organic polymers on the other hand when other elements form polymers they are regarded as inorganic polymers means inorganic polymers are composed of elements forming the backbone other than carbon say for example we can have sulfur as backbone forming polysulfur right uh, phosphorus 
can also poly can also form uh, polymeric uh, macromolecules and another most important uh, inorganic uh, polymer could be silicon having SiO Si backbone that is other than carbon so all these are uh, inorganic polymers and uh, in this course actually we don't have much scope to discuss on inorganic polymers we will discuss on the organic polymers that is having carbon carbon backbone however this silicon oxygen silicon backbone that is silicon polymers these also are commercially very important so we will discuss something on this silicon polymers uh, when the opportunity would come. Otherwise, we will always be concentrating on the synthesis, properties, applications and all other aspects of organic polymers that is, that is having carbon-carbon backbone. Now, when we consider these uh, polymers, that is what we mentioned that they form a macromolecule with a chain forming this carbon carbon uh, formed by this carbon carbon backbone now with this organic polymers we can still have the concept of isomerism now for small organic molecules we have read this isomerism uh, various isomerisms isomers existence of various isomers and we can extend that idea in case of polymers as well and we can show the existence of this isomerism. Now, regarding isomerism, the basic concept of isomerism is that iso means the same, mar means that chemical unit. So, having the same chemical unit, maybe that molecular formula is same, chemical formula is same, but the units that are being arranged in different ways or utilizing different bonds or linkages so that what we can also have in case of polymers and here we can show the existence of such types of isomerism in polymers so let us first start with the positional isomerism positional isomerism means where we have a different linkage not in terms of nature of linkage because we have mentioned that always the linkage is going to be covalent in nature so it is not by uh, i mean uh, nature of the linkage rather the units that are being bound through covalent bonds in a monomeric unit or repeating unit when that alters when that changes then we can have the existence of positional isomerism so from for uh, this isomerism let us first clear the concept of head and tail positioning in a monomer now suppose we have this monomer that repeating unit as vinyl chloride right now this is vinyl chloride existing as a repeating unit within a polymer called polyvinyl chloride or pvc abbreviated as pvc now this carbon this carbon it contains chlorine as a substituent so we can consider this carbon as the head of the repeating unit and this carbon which is methylene this as the tail in the repeating unit so one if one is considered head the another one should be tail but there is no hard and fast rule that the more substituted carbon to be named as head and the other one to be tail it could be reverse as well so if we designate suppose here this carbon containing chlorine as a head then while we have the polymer form using this repeating unit if we can write over here So we have written two repeating units. So here what we see that the head carbon is bound to the tail carbon of another repeating unit. So this linkage is called head 
to tail linkage right and this is the mostly desired linkage and during the reaction this sort of linkage is formed generally now we can have alteration right that is like this that is a head is bound to head of another repeating unit so this is called head head linkage similarly we can also have tail tail linkage right so when hd linkage is replaced with hh linkage or tt linkage in a chain then although it forms a same polymer that is polyvinyl chloride but in some intermediate positions we can have this sort of alteration in linkages and that creates the existence of positional isomerism so when the head position is bound to tail which is common but instead of tail if the head position is bound to another head position of the repeating unit then it is a difference in the position that are being bound and hence it creates an isomerism with the same polymer that is polyvinyl chloride and that is known as the positional isomerism now you may ask that why we are concerned about this the reason is if you follow this two structure that the distance between these two chlorine means how these are separated these are being separated by this methylene group in ht addition whereas when we go for hh addition these chlorines are not separated by a methylene group rather these are positioned in two subsequent carbons so the repulsive interaction between these two chlorine will be much higher as compared to this one so when we have a stronger repulsive interaction that might reflect in the properties of the polymer right and the extent to which this sort of i mean uh, different linkages which is not normal or rather unusual because we can see the activation energy for the formation of hd linkage is always lower than that of, that of hh linkage because once the hh linkage is formed the repulsive interaction of between these two chlorine would try to destabilize it so that way the activation energy is high and usually it is not formed but maybe during uh, the reaction with some additional uh, supply of heat or energy or because of the uh, i mean uh, collision collision and energy gained uh, by the uh, collision energy gained by the monomers during the reaction that might help uh, to achieve this activation energy and some uh, of the linkages uh, being formed with uh, of this hh type uh, during the formation of the polymer so once we have this hh linkage that would be uh, i mean that would create some impact on the overall properties of the polymer that is pvc here uh, and if we have more such hh linkages the impact is going to be higher as well now uh, apart from this uh, positional isomerism we can have a uh, stereo isomerism and we know that stereo isomerism is uh, the three dimensional orientation of the substituents present and uh, in stereo isomerism we have in case of polymers three kinds of stereo isomerism with respect to a uh, rigid center which what we consider as an asymmetric carbon uh, that is a carbon having four different bonds so such type of carbons which uh, in organic chemistry we call uh, optically active carbon asymmetric carbons so such against that uh, carbon centers we can have uh, different orientations of the substituents the sequence of orientations of the substituents against that asymmetric carbon and accordingly we name them as isotactic syndiotactic and atactic so if you take this example which is uh, a polymethyl methacrylate as a polymer being shown here and we can see that this is a flying wedge projection formula of uh, polymethyl methacrylate and in this structure suppose this one we see that x 
the substrate when it occurs in the same i mean plane and you can see the wedge in the x are occurring in the wedge bonds for every asymmetric center of this carbon right so this shows that the similar position of x against this asymmetric center in all the five repeating units being shown here so this uh, orientation will be regarded as isotactic orientation iso iso means same so or uh, in all asymmetric centers we have the same positioning of this x group so that way this uh, isomerism or this orientation is known as isotactic orientation now if we come to this second structure then we see that the position of x is just altered right so here it is in the wedge means which is above the plane and the next carbon we see in the next carbon we see that it is in the other one other way round that is it is below the plane so that way it is being altered it is being altered uh, and because of this alteration because of this alteration in position of x we call it this orientation as syndio syndio tactic syndio tactic orientation and when when we have an uh, i mean a mixed orientation that is no such kind of similarity right no such kind of similarity exists that is c for these two carbons these two asymmetric centers we have the position of x same right in the wedge position means above the plane but in the next carbon we can see that it is below the plane then next one below the plane then next one again below the plane then next one above the plane then next one below the plane so we do not have uh, any sequence any particular sequence in which the x is oriented against this asymmetric center right so that way it is what we call it as a mixed orientation that is the first one was isotactic where we had the same side orientation same kind of orientation of x second one was syndiotactic where we have the alternate orientation and third one is the mixed orientation that is it is a mix between isotactic and syndiotactic and that is why it is called atactic so this orientation is called atactic now these are actually what we call it as a configurations right configurations because we cannot change the position of x in this polymeric form just by rotating this carbon carbon bond unless we break the bond and then rotate and the bond is again reformed we cannot convert one orientation into other right so if suppose here if we consider the syndiotactic orientation suppose if you want to make it atactic just by uh, doing some chemical reactions or anything just by or by physical uh, process of rotating against this carbon bond it is not possible to do so so what we need to do that we have to break this bond then we have to rotate the carbon and then we have to reform this bond with x right so in this total operation will give you then both these x as the same position so these uh, isomers are regarded as uh, these isomers are regarded as configurations because because unless we break and reform the bond we are not able to convert one form into the other so that is the rule of configurations so we have thus three configurations possible for uh, repeating units that contain substituents as isotactic syndiotactic and atactic now once we have these uh, configurations that actually strongly impacts the property of the polymers now if you have a isotactic orientation means all the carbons the substituents are placed in the same direction or position so this isotactic has a long range symmetry what we call it as a long range symmetry 
and because of this long range symmetry the isotactic polymers are highly crystalline and once we have a uh, higher amount of crystallinity in a polymer so that can improve the mechanical properties of the polymer and also it could give you higher density and many other uh, properties right so when we have isotactic orientation we have some grade of uh, properties similarly if it is a syndiotactic orientation although we have the alternate position of x but again it gives a long sequence of symmetry because this alternate sequence is being carried out throughout the chain and that gives a long range symmetry and once we have a long range symmetry in a polymeric chain that would again gives rise to crystallinity and once the polymer becomes crystalline then it would give you higher mechanical properties and also higher density and again some grade of mechanical properties which are close to the isotactic polymeric form now if we have uh, the atactic orientation uh, then for the same uh, polymer that is having the same chemical structure we would see that the polymer is not crystalline because it does not have a long range symmetry the symmetry may be short range suppose here these two carbons are isotactic now these two carbon is syndiotactic right and these onwards these onwards it is syndiotactic these three then here again we have uh, sorry these three is isotactic same then here between these two it is what we call it as a syndiotactic so that way we have a short short range of symmetry and once we have that short short range of symmetries then it would not allow the polymeric chain to crystallize and once that polymeric chain is not crystallized so the mechanical property density these are going to be less in values and accordingly we will have some mechanical property deterioration so we can give you example of uh, polypropylene polypropylene both isotactic polypropylene and syndiotactic polypropylene is are much superior in mechanical properties whereas the atactic polypropylene it is just like wax it is so soft it is just like wax very soft with almost no mechanical properties so you can just deform it like wax and it is an industrial waste because the atactic polypropylene because of its so inferior mechanical property it is not being commercially used and it is being just thrown away so this much of a difference in uh, properties we can observe if uh, for the same polymer we have different tacticity now if there is any unsaturation present within the uh, main chain of the polymer then we can also have a stereo uh, I mean uh, isomerism or configurations of uh, the polymers say for example if we have a uh, say polybutadiene if we have polybutadiene then polybutadiene the butadiene monomer is CH to double bond CH CH CH2 from this butadiene monomer we can have C's C's form we can have trans form C's form means where we have say methyl and hydrogen in the same side or alternatively the part of the chain from this double bonded carbon those those positions are uh, placed in the same side of the double bond so from that point of view it is called a C's configuration and when we have the reverse then it is called a trans configuration so C's 1 4 and trans 1 4 so these two are geometrical isomers we can have an apart from that we can also have 1 2 structure 1 2 structure means where we have suppose the polymerization between this carbon and this carbon right so the double bond will open up and develop the polymer and this vinyl part will remain as the pendant side group so once we have that vinyl part remaining as a pendant side group so that gives rise to another configuration of one two right one two so in total we can have c's trans and one two configurations or isomers for polybutadiene so with the same 
chemical formula because of the positioning of these uh, I mean groups and the uh, polymerization center we can have uh, geometrical isomers and uh, configurations and for example for polybutadiene we can set three configurations like C strands and one two structures. Now as I mentioned that uh, this tacticity that is this configurations in polymers that can give rise to uh, I mean difference much difference in property because uh, that affects the chain flexibility chain packing polymeric chain packing free volume etc and once these uh, properties vary then we can have a difference in crystallization and that ultimately uh, impacts the uh, property physical property of the polymers and also it can impact uh, the glass transition temperature of the polymer the glass transition temperature uh, is some is is a specific uh, zone of temperature in which the uh, polymer this macromolecule it turns into hard glass it is just like uh, inorganic glass formation it has a similarity to that and for that reason this sort of solidification of amorphous phase of the polymer macromolecules is known as the glass transition phenomenon and that glass transition uh, for polymeric systems all polymers have glass transitions and this glass transition value is utilized uh, as a foot I mean an identity of a polymer just like we have several uh, ID cards so this for polymers this TG uh, we abbreviate this as a TG glass transition temperature this acts as the identity of the polymer for example uh, for many common polymers uh, if we name a polymer then we can say that this is the TG of the polymer and similarly without naming the polymer if we mention that uh, we have a polymer having this TG then you will be able to understand that what polymer I am referring so it is either way so from that point of view we generally uh, consider this glass transition temperature of a polymer as its identity now because of this tacticity we can see the glass transition temperature is also impacted now glass transition temperature is impacted because of the presence of these interactions intermolecular interactions presence of pendant groups polarity etc there are many factors and we will read this separately so for this tacticity actually the glass transition temperature uh, become different right so this also uh, I mean this tacticity and orientation that definitely also impacts the glass transition temperature and once the glass transition temperature is impacted the physical property of the polymer changes. Now for this uh, tacticity as I mentioned for uh, polymers those are having a uh, substitution this tacticity, tacticity is very important because it determines the overall property and hence the application of the polymers so it is necessary to understand this uh, tacticity determinate also we must know how to find out this tacticity and also how to analyze this uh, tacticity now let us consider uh, this example that suppose we have uh, this kind of a, a polymer molecule where x is the substituent and we consider h to t that is head to tail orientation h to tail uh, head to tail bonding while the polymer is formed now this is what we call it as a isotactic isotactic part of a chain isotactic part or isotactic polymer we can also refer now why because the x is present in the same side or same position with respect to this asymmetric carbons so this is what we call it as a isotactic and this represents the syndiotactic that is in one carbon it is in this side this x and the next asymmetric carbon the x is in the other side so we have the perfect alteration of the position of x so this is what we call it as a syndio tactic now here we have written two asymmetric centers right so these are known as dyads means where two such centers or positions are shown 
so in these two diets one for isotactic and another one for syndiotactic we can consider them as this isotactic as the meso diet and this syndiotactic as the racemic diet now meso and racemic in organic chemistry they are referred to internally symmetrical molecule this meso and externally symmetrical molecule this racemic what do you mean by internally symmetrical molecule now with this meso diet if you consider this methylene a plane then this part and this part acts as a mirror image to each other means symmetrical right whereas in case of syndiotactic if you put a mirror here then this part is not symmetrical to this but if you rotate this part separately if it is possible then they become symmetrical so this is what we call it as the external symmetry because when you detach this part then it can easily rotate and give a symmetrical orientation to this so that way this diet that is syndiotactic diet is referred as racemic whereas the isotactic diet is referred as meso now once there is a synthesis of this polymer that could give this possible orientations that is isotactic or syndiotactic then while the third i mean carbon or the third asymmetric center takes its orientation we can i mean calculate the probability or chance of having an isotactic or syndiotactic orientation in the third chance that is this is first this is second and this is the third chance so these are what what we call it as a triad these are the these are the triad right these are the triads now this is isotactic triad this is syndiotactic triad and this is heterotactic triad now if we consider that if there is no heterotactic triad formation only we allow isotactic and syndiotactic triad formations then how much is the chance of formation of isotactic triad in the third sequence and how much is the chance of the formation of the syndiotactic triad in the third sequence so we can theoretically calculate that now this chance means what what we call it as the probability and probability is nothing but the fraction in mathematical terms so if the isotactic triad formation is denoted by the probability pm m stands for meso triad and if the chance for formation of the syndiotactic triad is your racemic triad then we can write as pm plus pr equals to 1 because each of these pm and pr are nothing but fractions so probability is a fraction and the total sum of the fraction is always 1 that is 100% means when the molecule is being formed now how to represent this pm and pr for their calculation pm is ki by ki plus uh, ks now what is this ki it is the rate constant for the formation of isotactic triad and ks is the rate constant for formation of the syndiotactic triad now ki by ki plus ks now this is the total probability because we have only two options one is isotactic another one is syndiotactic so once you sum up these two it means that total what could be the structure form is a combination of isotactic syndiotactic so it is the total formation of the structures and how much in it is isotactic it means that the fraction of isotacticity that could be formed it is denoted by pm and similarly pr is ks by ki plus ks so that way for the formation of isotactic triad what is the chance how to calculate that that is pi equals to for the first one it was pm the probability pm second one is also isotactic so it is also pm so when you have 
this sequence, this is an isotactic sequence and the chance for formation of this isotactic sequence is PM and this is the second one. Here also we are having in this case another isotactic sequence of PM into PM giving you total probability as PM square. Similarly, for syndiotactic, so here we have the syndiotactic formation diode, so it is PS and the here also it is repeated syndiotactic, so another PS, so PS square. Now, as actually it is denoted by racemic, so it is PR, PR, so PR square. Now, PR is 1 minus PM, so we can write 1 minus PM whole square is the probability for the formation of syndiotactic triad. And for heterotactic triad, what we have, this is the first sequence and this is the second sequence. The first sequence is isotactic, so it is meso and the second sequence is syndiotactic, so it is PR, so PM into 1 minus PM. Now, as we have considered two consecutive reactions so twice so this is this gives us the probability of heterotactic that is pH equals to 2 pm into 1 minus pm so these are the probabilities of an asymmetric center in forming the isotactic syndiotactic and heterotactic triads in any sequence of a reaction now if we consider a gradual increase in percentage of isotacticity in a polymer chain then how come this heterotacticity and this syndiotacticity and also this isotacticity of course how that changes based on this probability for during a polymerization we see as the isotactic pro your probability that is formation of mesotriers, tetrads, pentrads means gradually the sequence is increased and the fraction is also increased then we have a an increase in this isotactic structure formation the probability increases and simultaneously as this pi the probability increases we have a downward trend of the syndiotactic structure formation that probability decreases and this heterotacticity as this heterotacticity combines both pi and ps then it would increase to a certain value and then it would decrease so this is the trend that we can show based on this probability for the formation of such stereo centers or this tacticity during a polymerization and this is why significant because this eventually controls the properties of the polymer based on the percentage of certain tacticity it contains after the synthesis. Now we know that uh, if you want to develop certain structure or configuration you need to offer more control for the reaction and for that if we just polymerize uh, any monomer it can give you a heterotacticity that is the random orientation that is most common because we know that if you offer less control the system is going to be more random because that is the nature of the system. So if you want to have a dominant isotactic uh, structure formation and a dominant syndiotactic structure formation you need to use certain catalysts which can give you those orientations and the category of catalyst that is being used is called the ziegler natta catalyst and also in the recent times we have developed another grade of catalyst which is called metallocene catalyst and we will read all this about this catalyst so this ziegler natta catalyst or metallocene catalyst you have to employ to get this regularity in the structures that is isotacticity or syndiotacticity. Now, for your polymers, if you have this kind of uh, tacticity or scope of formation of this tacticity, which we generally have because uh, most of the polymers has got that pendant groups, particularly the addition polymers. So, there the existence of tacticity, the question of existence of percentage of certain tacticity comes into the question. and to analyze this structure this orientation becomes very important to characterize those problems uh, polymers uh, in order to sort out that what kind of properties it is going to give you and this is also important that when you are developing certain catalyst 
in your laboratory for polymerizing in certain orientation of monomers then after employment of that catalyst during the synthesis what kind of orientation actually you are getting right so you need also to uh, analyze that structure and see that what is the efficiency of your catalyst so it could be from both the perspective of material development as well as the process or technology development for the polymerization to give you certain orientation so once you uh, do some research on that or even uh, you have received certain polymer uh, which is unlabeled the tacticity is not uh, being mentioned there so if you have to determine the tacticity so there could be many situations where this you need to analyze the tacticity of the polymer or this orientation of the polymer so how to do that we have to take the help of uh, the analytical tools uh, and that uh, would give rise uh, that would give you the evidence of uh, the structures so we can take the help of uh, optical absorption uh, studies like electronic transitions uh, quite often we have seen that that depends on the structure and also on the sequence of uh, microstructures that are being uh, present within the polymer and also the vibrational spectroscopy like Raman spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy. So all this vibrational spectroscopy that is dependent on the vibrations of the uh, bonds uh, in some cases unpolarized and in some cases polarized uh, bonds. Uh, so that would uh, help to understand the, cert the certain linkage formation because when we have uh, that tacticity that eventually uh, I mean give certain orientation uh, so that this sort of vibrational spectroscopy sometimes becomes uh, uh, very helpful in analyzing the uh, I mean orientations of the polymers but most convincing uh, tool is the NMR spectroscopy that is very specific to the environment of a certain certain elements that have odd number of electrons now within a polymer the elements that have odd number of electrons are sensitive towards externally applied magnetic field uh, because when you have odd number of electrons within an atom then it also creates an internal magnetic field and because of the existence of internal magnetic field such type of uh, I mean molecules or rather atoms they become sensitive towards the externally applied magnetic field and they would try to orient themselves against that ex externally applied magnetic field and the amount of energy required to disorient those uh, structures is the energy required to analyze uh, I mean um, in, in this spectroscopy of what we call it as a nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy now this uh, nuclear magnetic spectroscopy uh, this is applicable as I mentioned for uh, atoms which have a odd number of uh, electrons say proton that is hydrogen then we can have say carbon uh, not the normal isotope of carbon that is C12 it should be C13 uh, then we can have silicon silicon 29 Si29 then phosphorus so these sort of element specific NMR instruments are available through which we can study the environment that is the bonding of these specific elements within a compound or if we refer a polymer structure within a polymer now as we know these organic uh, polymers they essentially contains hydrogen so for analyzing the tacticity uh, employment of proton enamel means that analyzes the orientation of protons or hydrogen that becomes very significant also we can use the carbon enamel as well that is c13 enamel that is also we can use but proton enamel is more popular in case of polymers now if we consider the tacticity is say in this structure that is pmma again polymethyl methacrylate now if we want to notice or if you want to analyze the absorption of these methylene protons in the spectrum now this is an isotactic orientation and this is a syndiotactic orientation now if we see 
the environment of this proton right the environment actually determines the orientation of the peak and its splitting now this proton it has these two proton in two sides whereas this proton sees these two ester groups now characteristically then this proton is different from this proton because this proton has two methyl as its environment in the environment whereas this proton has two ester groups in its environment so from that point of view these two protons become different and they these two protons will not appear as a single peak or what we call it as a singlet peak rather it would give you a v pattern of absorption or the orientation in the spectrum and they are distinguishable that is this proton and this proton are different when these protons are different they will appear not as a single absorption but as a i mean different absorptions so when we see that ab pattern of absorption with distinguishable protons then we will assume that this is going to be an isotactic orientation on the other hand the same this methylene proton if in the spectrum we can see that these two methylene protons which have the similar environment you see this proton because of this alternation in the structure this proton have this methyl and this ester group similarly this proton also has this ester and the methyl in its environment so characteristically these two protons becomes equal unlike what we had in this case of isotactic structure so in syndiotactic structure what we see that these two proton this methylene protons they are indistinguishable and they would give you a single absorption peak so if we consider uh, that kind of uh, i mean orientation so here you see syndiotactic this belongs to this proton so it is a single peak whereas we have two peaks in case of isotactic so characteristic difference because of the environment change for the two protons gives multiple peaks whereas for syndiotactic it gives a single peak so this is the way a very convincing way of i mean uh, identifying this uh, tacticity of uh, uh, polymers now this is the spectrum of an atactic polymethyl methacrylate and here we see a dominant singlet peak right so when we have a dominant singlet peak this becomes very similar to a syndiotactic structure so what we can see or we can conclude the atactic or the heterotactic structure of polymethyl methacrylate that has a similarity or more percentage of syndiotactic orientation than isotactic orientation means this heterotactic structure is contains percentage wise more syndiotactic asymmetric centers than isotactic asymmetric centers so this is the way by which we can easily identify this tacticity and accordingly we can analyze the polymer uh, if it is an rnd job or if you being offered uh, to find out the tacticity so for all sorts of job you can do the analysis very convincingly with using this nmr now next part is the synthesis of four copolymers right now we can skip this one because we have a uh, separate chapter on copolymers and uh, there we will read about this now after this uh, configuration of the uh, polymers let us now come to conformations and we know that unlike configurations where one configure uh, i mean <coughs> configurational isomer if you want to change that to another one like that isotactic to syndiotactic you have to break the bond rotate carbon carbon bond rotate against the carbon carbon bond a part of that chain and then you have to again reform the bond and then only you will be see the similarity in the structure or asymmetric center so that is for the configurations but for conformations we just can have a rotation between this carbon carbon in the main chain and we can see that they energetically the uh, some difference is created between the two structures once there is a rotation against the carbon carbon bond so these are called conformations where we have just 
need the supply of energy to rotate against the carbon carbon bond in the main chain and once one carbon rotates against this carbon in the main chain then it would rotate along with its bond so the groups which are present here originally then the level of interaction it was having with the substituents of the carbon so once you rotate the position say by 60 degree then we see the position of these groups changes and the level of interaction between these two i mean carbons that is the substituents of these two carbons that also alters or changes so sometimes that interaction may give rise to more repulsive interaction so after your rotation the energy content the potential energy might increase for the rotated uh, structure so that may be uh, a higher energy structure so you need to give some energy for uh, that rotation to achieve that high energy structure or it may so happen that because of that rotation some additional interaction could uh, be developed and that can reduce because of that attraction or uh, uh, attractive interaction the energy is reduced and uh, because of that rotation it might go to a more stable structure now because uh, of this uh, availability of this uh, carbon carbon rotation against single bond so we can we can uh, here uh, i mean uh, try to judge that how this polymer chains which are macromolecules where we have this carbon carbon rotation uh, feasible or possible that how these chains or macromolecules are oriented now whether these macromolecules are oriented uh, just like a straight chain or it remains in the form of coil now for that we uh, assume uh, certain things regarding the polymer chain number one that these polymer chains the i mean the repeating units or uh, the units which are uh, similar and they are bonded together forming these macromolecules uh, often we call it as a segment so these segments are highly flexible with respect to each other that is one segment can rotate much easily with respect to its neighboring segments without hampering any sort of energy between these two interaction energy so that what we call it as a freely jointed chain so this is the first assumption that the polymer chains are freely jointed and second is that these chains would give random work now what is that random work random work means that work of a drunken person how we characterize that work work so uh, in some uh, i mean places if uh, a drunken person works we might see that there is a margin of the footprint suppose this is the footprint of uh, this left leg and if this is for the right leg so we can see margin of the footprint so this is what we call it as a random work but when a normal person uh, works then we do not see the margin right we can see like this so these are separated so random work and freely jointed chain kind of uh, bonding these are the two basic assumptions we make while we consider that how the polymer chains exists in order to analyze the existence of the polymer chain these are the two essential assumptions now if we if we consider uh, or uh, this sort of uh, i mean uh, properties for the polymer chain then what we uh, need to do in order to see that whether the polymer chain exists as a straight chain or it exists in the form of a coil so what we must uh, uh, calculate that is what parameter we must calculate or consider in order to conclude on this it is the chain end to end distance that is a polymer an organic polymer 
which has two ends, right? Which has two ends, and if we find, if we find or calculate the end to end distance, that is distance between two chain ends. If we calculate that and see that what what values it gives, from there we will be able to say that whether the polymer is existing or it generally exists as a straight chain or it exists as a bent or coil. Now for that if we consider this polymer chain is composed of say n number of uh, such bonds, segments, whatever and length of each bond say L. So n is the number of bonds forming the polymer and L is the length of each bond. Right? Or we can also assign that n is the number of segments and l is the length of each segment. So either way we can assign. So if the polymer exists as a straight chain, then what should be the value of the chain end to end distance that is n into l. Right? Because it contains say n number of bonds and each bond is of the length l. So n into l gives me the total distance between the two ends had the polymer existed in the form of a straight chain. Now as there is a thermal motion uh, that is existing within a polymer molecule because these are freely jointed chain and these segments can I mean one segment with respect to another they can freely rotate with respect to each other without hampering the interaction energy. So at any point of time, because of this thermal motion, it might so happen this end to end distance, these values will keep on changing for every instant because of the thermal motion. So for that, let us consider the polymer molecule in this way, that is in this three dimensional uh, existence because every, every, uh, uh, I mean, earthly, uh, objects these are three dimensional so as this polymer molecules so if we consider that this is the origin this is say our uh, y this is x and this is z now in this origin we just fix one end of the polymer chain in this origin and the other chain other part is like this so it if it is a straight line it would be like this right this is another end this is zero 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 right this is now this is going to be n into l that we have already assigned if it is a straight line this is the distance right now if it is not in the form of a straight line if it is coiled then it would exist like this so this is the another end so here now this is the distance right this is the distance this is the other end and this is the distance so actually what we need to find out now with this placement or orientation of the chain is that one is the origin from origin to the, the distance between the origin and the coordinate of the other end of the polymer chain. So we need to find that distance only. So that would give me that value that I want to check. Now if it is a straight line then it is like this n into l and if it is coil it is like this. Now, as I mentioned that there is a thermal motion existing and the polymer chain is highly flexible as well as it can move in random work mode. So, every moment there is a change in end to end distance because of the motions, right? So, there could be incessant change, I mean variation in the end to end distance, right? So, if I want to calculate this end to end distance, I must take the average of this individual end to end distance values. Now, as there is a random kind of orientation possible for this polymer chain because of the thermal motion and by the law of mathematics, rather the law of statistics for a random orientation, if I want to calculate this distance, which is nothing but the distance between the two coordinates, that is one is the origin and another one where the other end of the polymer chain is placed at that instant, right? So, if I want to take the average of this because of the random orientation, the average would come to zero. It means that the number of positive distances 
that we have is always going to be equal with that of the negative distances. Now positive negative distance we designate by the direction because this distance is a vector quantity and the value will always come along with the coordinate axis sign that is whether it is in the positive coordinate or negative coordinate. Now as the uh, orientation is random so it, in from the law of statistics that the number of positive orientations we have must be equals to the number of negative orientation. So if I want to calculate the average based on this n to n distance, then that average value, say r, if r denotes n to n distance, so that average value is going to be 0. So this is not the route by which we will be able to calculate the n to n distance in order to find the what is the most stable orientation of the polymer chain, whether it is stable at, uh, I mean, your uh, the straight line that is, it is uh, in the straight line form or it is coiled form. So, what could be the other way of calculating? Now, instead of just taking this uh, distance, just this distance, if we take the square of the distance, right? Suppose uh, this say x1. If we suppose one distance, if we consider say this one, it is x1. Suppose this is say x2, and in the reverse direction we also had minus x1 minus x2. So when when we were adding them to get the average, we were getting zero, right? So for that reason, we are now considering the square of this distance. So x1 square plus x2 square, and in the reverse side we had minus x1 x1 and minus x2 and once we take the square then minus x1 becomes plus x1 square. So it would become again x1 square and x2 square. So all the negative distances because of this square transformation of distance they would become positive. So now there is no chance of getting that zero value. So we will be able to calculate the distance now. So this is what, what we call it as the square of the distance, right? Square of the distance. And once we take the average of the square of the distance, it would call the mean square distance. Mean square distance, right? Now, this mean square distance, that average, we, we set up a function for that expression and it follows the Gaussian distribution function because we have an ideal uh, distribution of uh, this uh, distance because of the random orientation and that ideal distribution function is the Gaussian distribution function and in order to calculate the average means we have to integrate that and from there by putting the limits that is of R, the maximum R value would be N into L when the polymer chain exists in the straight lines, that, that is the higher limit. And the lower limit during integration we need to put R as 0. That is when the polymer chain would just coil into one single point. So the end to end distance becomes 0. So these are the two limiting distance we can have. We, and we put these values during integration. And after integration we get this value as the mean square distance. That is R square N, N stands for that N number of bonds or N number of segments that is forming the polymer and 0 is what it is in the relaxed mode or when the polymer chain is unstressed, is in unstressed condition or their general existence. So it becomes that R N square which is the mean square, mean square of N to N distance of a polymer chain that becomes equals to n l square n into l square now you see that if you now just calculate the distance from here we have to take the square root that is r n 0 it is what we call it as a rms that is root mean square root mean square n to n distance or rms n to n distance. So RMS n to n distance that is equals to wow, how much? You have to take the square root of it. So n to the power half into L. Right? So had the polymer chain 
existed that we were assuming that whether it exists as a straight chain then its end to end distance would have been pn pl but from mathematical conclusion we see that this average distance is coming as n to the power half into l so n to the power half into l means that the end to end distance between the two ends of a polymer chain this is less than if the polymer chain would have existed as a straight line so what it indicates that the average distance is less than the end to end distance is less than when a polymer chain exists as a straight line or straight chain it means that in most of the times the polymer chain exists in the form of a coil so here we can conclude that a polymer chain is not straight but it exists as a coil in melt because in melt or in normal case when it uh, i mean it during its general existence it exists in the form of coil and this is what the stable orientation or stable conformation of the polymer so in a unstretched condition the polymer is in the relaxed state and the relaxed state of a polymer is its coil state is its coil state now this proves that the polymer chain you you have to give effort on the polymer chain to make it straight otherwise it would exist in the form of coil so the straightened form of a polymer chain is the stressed form stressed form means you have to give energy to orient it in the straight form otherwise if you do not offer any stress or if you do not give any energy from the external source it will exist in the form of a coil now because of this coil existence we can also further assign two more advantages to the polymer structure and what are this number one when it is coil it is coil in a random mode so it is a random coil now when it is in random coil mode it implies that it has a little orientation right little to no orientation basically no orientation so when there is no orientation in coiling it means that it exists with high entropy and we know that for any orientation if the entropy is high because of the randomness or no orderliness then that is going to be a stable orientation so from that thermodynamic point of view we can also confirm or justify this coiled orientation of the polymer under unstressed condition this is number 1 and number 2 when it is in the coil form the surface area is also less and we know that each and every substance particularly the liquids right the liquids as polymer is a semi solid means it is semi liquid so being a semi liquidic in nature because it has that viscous property we mentioned it is visco elastic prominent viscous character and elastic character so viscous character or viscosity is the property of a liquid and elastic character or elasticity is the property of a solid so as polymer bears both the properties right and the exhibition of both the properties is significant so it would always try to reduce the surface area resembling the liquid like behavior so from that point of view this coiled structure coil orientation under unstressed condition is further justified now when the polymer exists in the form of coil then let us see how much volume it occupies right now if uh, i mean the volume uh, how to calculate the volume now when it forms a coil in three dimension the uh, space allotted for the coil that is the volume is the sphere right so the volume of the sphere means like a ball so the volume is say 4/3 pi r cube right 4/3 pi r cube now if uh, i mean it uh, exist uh, 
in the form of this uh, your uh, straight uh, chain and if it exists in the form of a coil right now when we try to calculate uh, uh, this volume when it is in the straight chain right when it exists in the form of a straight chain then it is n into l that is the length so half n into l so that gives n cube and n to the power 3 by 2 into l cube that is the volume when it is form a straight chain that is volume in the say stressed condition or when polymer exists as a straight chain so 4 third pi r cube that is the radius so half half of this n into l so it's cube so n cube and l cube so it means that the volume it is proportional to n cube why n is much much bigger than l because number of bonds forming a polymer chain it could be in the range of say 10,000, 20,000 whereas L which denotes the length of one bond it could be in the order of say 1.54 uh, angstrom uh, for a carbon-carbon uh, single bond. So you can imagine that how much N is greater, could be greater than L. So um, we can approximately assume that the volume of a polymer chain if it exists in the form of a straight chain it is about n cube whereas when it if it exists in the form of a coil then we have that average end to end distance as its average end to end distance how much is the end to end distance that is n to the power half into l so four third pi half n to the power half into l right so three by two and it is l cube Right. So, here what we see that the volume is proportional to n to the power 3 by 2. Right. So, from here we can say that the theoretical volume that we calculate assuming the polymer if the polymer existed in the form of a straight line in terms of the number of bonds and uh, the uh, lengthwise so that theoretical volume is going to be less than that of the practical volume when the polymer exists in the form of a coil when the polymer exists in the form of a coil so that what we see that the volume of a coil which is the actual existence is greater than the volume of theoretical existence in straight line of a polymer chain so it means that when the polymer exists in the form of coil it contains more free volume or free space so because of this free space this coil conformation it can accept more foreign materials in it and this is the reason that we can put more ingredients particularly if you consider a rubber which has much much higher free volume as compared to general polymer we can add so many ingredients while we process or while we compound polymers and because of that addition we see there is hardly any change in volume of the polymeric mass and it is because it contains so much of free volume inside because of the coil orientation we can modify this polymer with so many ingredients that we think that it is proper or appropriate. So this is a fundamental understanding about the polymer conformation, about the existence of this huge free volume which allows the polymer to be compounded with the help of so many ingredients and this is the reason polymer can hold them without increasing the volume. 
So this is uh, up to which uh, we have planned to discuss in our first class. Here onwards, that is, we have uh, more left uh, in the confirmations uh, part because this is what we have discussed uh, on the free volume and also the confirmation uh, based on polymer chain end-to-end -end orientation. Now, when we assume about a real chain, that is, which has some restriction in orientation, that is, some restriction in assuming certain conformations energy-wise, then we will see that the end-to-end -end distance is changing and accordingly, the volume is also changing. But let me tell you that the practical volume occupied by the polymer, that is always going to be higher than the theoretical one. And from that sense, it is justified that polymer contains lot of free volume, this real chains even, they contain a lot of free volumes and they can accept other ingredients without a much increase in its volume. So here we end the discussion of our uh, first lecture. So see you all in the second lecture.